everyone. My name is Yi Long, and I'm the CEO of Mega East. Today, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Today, I would like to uh, share with you some of the performance-related works we've been doing at Mega East, and in particular, I would like to give you a quick overview of the. Today's uh, performance at the uh, Ethereum execution layer, and uh, share some thoughts on where we think this is going in the future. Okay, cool. So at Mega ETH, we're working on uh, techniques to accelerate Ethereum at layer two. So uh, most of our works focus on the uh, improving the execution client. So that would be Geth, Aragon, or Reth. And unfortunately, it would be impossible to um, improve. Uh, to design truly high performance systems without first understanding uh, the state of the art. Unfortunately, we couldn't find any good, um, we couldn't find any uh, good performance data that are up to date. Um, I think this also explains why the, uh, the limitations of existing systems are usually poorly understood outside uh, maybe the, the, the core dev team. Uh, so we decided to take a rigorous approach from the very beginning named uh, measure then build. So following this approach, uh, we first, uh, there are basically two steps. We first need to carry out a very deep performance measurement um, of the existing systems to learn the real problems, and then we can design new techs needs to actually address these problems. Um, so this talk will be structured in two parts. Uh, in, the, in part one, I'm going to do a, um, I'm going to share some interesting lessons we learned from uh, profiling the REST uh, execution client. I'm going to try to answer questions like, um, um, what are the current bottlenecks of execution client and how did they change under uh, different conditions? And in part two, um, I'm going to uh, share some thoughts on how we can actually improve the execution performance at layer two and uh, how fast we can, how, how much performance we can squeeze out of, out of it uh, eventually. Okay, so um, before we dive into numbers, let's review some background knowledge. So an, um, an execution client basically has two major texts, execution and merkleization. Execution is basically um, executing the transactions and uh, applying the state chain uh, and updating the blockchain state. And merkleization is computing or updating the state root after these state changes. In Red, there are two sync modes that differ in uh, how often they update the state root. So uh, there's a historical sync, which is used to sync from the genesis block. Um, it's, um, and in this mode, Red will only update the state root um, after processing a large batch of blocks. And there's uh, also live sync, which is used to uh, keep up with the tip of the chain. And in this mode, the state root is only updated, um, uh, it, uh, the state root is going to be updated after each block. So our test server is uh, pretty powerful. It has um, five, uh, 512 gigabytes memory, and it has a pretty fast uh, MEME SSD. Um, the CPU core count doesn't really matter here because most of the workloads are going to be single threaded. And in order to simulate machines with uh, different memory sizes, we're going to use the Linux uh, cgroup command to control the, the amount of memory available to the REST process. And we uh, run a lot of experiments, both historical sync and live sync. And we run them under different uh, memory limits. So this allows us to study the bottlenecks of uh, execution clients under different modes and, under, and how these factors actually change under, under different conditions. Okay, so uh, let's talk about execution first. This is our first experiment. So we run the historical sync um, with all 500 gigabytes memory, and we only uh, persist our state changes every 500,000 blocks. This graph shows the execution throughput um, measured in TPS. Um, as, uh, so it's, um, so uh, X axis is the block height and Y axis is TPS. If we, um, if we focus, and, and it took us like 24 hours to sync from the genesis block to, to, the, to the tip, there will be uh, about 18 million blocks. And if we focus on just the last 1 million blocks, we can see that uh, REST can actually uh, process transaction at 14,000 TPS, uh, which is pretty good. Um, and know that this is all single thread performance because uh, REST doesn't have parallel EVN yet. And if we measure the performance in uh, gas per second, this is what you have. 
uh, just uh, same same graph, same, same access, uh, different y uh, different y axis. And if you also focus on the last one million blocks, uh, it can rest can achieve a thousand to two thousand million gas per second. Um, so um, modern EVN implementations are actually uh, quite um, actually quite efficient, uh, at least when the the state fits in memory. So uh, how much memory do you actually need to to run transactions uh, to to hold the state? Uh, this screenshot is a summary of the database tables uh, in a fully synced REST archive node. So you can see that, uh, so the total footprint, this is the archive size, is um, uh, 2.3 uh, terabytes. But fortunately, uh, in order to run transactions, you only need about, uh, in memory, you only need about 100 gigabytes data. Uh, these are called the plain state in REST. And by the way, um, the MPT, the MPT will, will take another uh, 126 uh, gigabytes. So this figure shows the time breakdown of historical sync. If we look at the, the red component, this is executing transactions. Uh, we can confirm that executing transactions is indeed the bottleneck of historical sync, responsible for almost two thirds of the total sync time. And I'm pretty sure that the other components, there are some low-hanging fruits that we can optimize them uh, further, and we, which will bring this, uh, the percentage of uh, executing transactions even higher. To understand um, why executing transactions are so expensive, um, we instrument the REVN interpreter, which is the EVN interpreter implementation used by REST, uh, to collect very detailed performance metrics uh, of each opcode. So uh, this is, uh, this, um, and we generate the following uh, opcode cost table. So this table has a lot of uh, detailed information, interesting information, but it's not meant to be uh, read on stage. So I'm just going to quickly walk through uh, the important information here, high level information here. So first of all, each row is, a, is an opcode, and each column is a different metric. So uh, in this table, so for each opcode, we have uh, its total count during the entire historical sync. We have uh, the total time spent on each opcode uh, measured in seconds, and also as a per percentage of the total time. And by the way, we rank this, we, we order this opcode in descending order of the, um, of the time consumption. And based on that, we can compute the cumulative percentage of time uh, uh, spent on the, um, the, the top K opcodes. And we can also compute uh, the average cost, uh, average cost per invocation for, for each opcode. And finally, we, we also have, um, we also show the category of this opcode. So based on, on, the, on, 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 on that table, we can graph the top 30 most time consuming opcodes. And uh, each blue bar here, uh, the, the, so the x-axis is the opcode, and the y-x. So and each blue bar is um, shows the percentage of time spent on an opcode, and its value can be read on the um, from from the left x from from the y-axis on the on the left. Sorry. And then the the red curve is the cumulative time percentage, and uh, the value can be read on the y-axis on the right. So we can see from this graph that first, 90% of the time is spent, actually spent on just the top 30 opcodes. And second, the top five uh, opcodes are static call, key check 256, slow call, and push one. And um, we can see that when the, um, when the state fits in memory, slow only takes uh, about 8.8% uh, of the total time. So, which means, uh, which says state access is actually not a bottleneck here. It's purely CPU bound in this case. We can also uh, group opcodes by their category, provide an alternate view. Uh, this pie chart shows the, uh, the time breakdown uh, by category. There are a few interesting things here. So, so first of all, uh, if you look at the left, the host plus system opcodes uh, will take more than 50% of the time. So this, uh, so the, uh, let me explain a little bit. So the host opcodes are basically used by EVN to interact with the surrounding environment. Uh, so like um, reading and writing the storage, outputting the logs, uh, et cetera. 
And the system opcodes is basically um, keep check uh, 256 plus a few other functions. And um, these uh, system and uh, host opcodes are relatively complex functions that implemented directly in the native language of the execution client. So in this case, we're profiling REST, so it's, uh, it's, uh, it's Rust. And second, um, the stack operations uh, is taking another 29% of the time. And the rest, uh, and the rest, 20% uh, time are spread across uh, arithmetic, bitwise, uh, bitwise operations, etc. So an interesting conclusion uh, we can make here is that an EVM JIT compiler can actually only achieve at most 2x speed up on Ethereum's historical workload uh, because it can only uh, accelerate opcodes on the right-hand side of this pie chart. Uh, the, 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 the host and system opcodes are already directly implemented in the native language in Rust. Okay, so um, now we have a pretty good understanding of um, the execution performance in a CPU bound setting. Let's switch gear a little bit and talk about uh, the impact of memory. So uh, it's no secret that REST can run pretty fast when, when the entire state fits, fits in memory. But what if uh, there's not enough memory to, to hold the state? Uh, folklore says the performance will suffer, but is it true? Let's find out. To understand this uh, impact of memory limit, we conduct this e experiment. We basically rerun the historical sync experiments and vary uh, the, amount of, uh, the amount of memory available to, to the REST processes. It will go from 8, 16, 30 gigabytes to 512 gigabytes. And we also, in addition, we have to reduce the disk flush period from uh, 500,000 to just uh, 1,000 blocks because um, so that uh, the experiments can actually complete uh, without uh, running out of memory. And this uh, value of 1,000 is uh, chosen empirically. And the result is actually a ple pleasant surprise. So this figure shows the total historical sync time uh, of the last, just the last 1 million blocks uh, as, a function, as a function of memory limit. So if we compare the data points at 8 gigabytes, and 512 gigabytes memory, we see that the, the overall so slowdown is actually less than 2x, meaning that even with just 8 gigabytes memory, REST can actually comfortably uh, process 7,000 to 8,000 transactions per second in historical sync. Why is that? Uh, the following, uh, the, um, the other three curves actually provide more information to explain this behavior. So from top to bottom, we have three other curves. The, the orange curve uh, is the, the amount of time spent on executing transactions. The green curve is the amount of time uh, spent on loading data from the underla underlying database into REST's uh, cache layer. And finally, uh, sorry, um, and the green curve, uh, yes, that, that's a green curve. I forgot what I said. Uh, by the way, the, the green curve, this is also where uh, disk IOs happen. And uh, at the bottom, the flat red curve is the amount of time spent on writing state changes back to the underlying database. So based on the shapes of these three curves, we can confirm that um, when you go from, when you increase memory limit from eight gigabytes to 5, uh, 512 gigabytes, uh, the total historical sync time drops because the total execution time drops, which is the, the orange curve. And the total execution time drops because, purely because um, the total uh, cache miss penalty drops, which is the green curve. Uh, but why do random disk I.O. only cur uh, incur an um, overall slowdown of less than 2x? It turns out that that's because uh, today's Ethereum workload actually has very strong uh, temporal locality, meaning that data they access recently uh, are very likely to be accessed again in the future. So this is a two-level uh, cache uh, architecture used by, by REST. So what happens is that uh, in REST, when EVN wants to uh, do a state access, it first looks into its own cache layer. And if it couldn't find the data there, um, uh, REST will uh, consult the underlying database, in this case MDBX, and try to load the data into its own cache layer. And this database also has its own uh, cache implementation. And in this case, MDBX uh, simply relies on the operating system's page cache. So based on our data, we realized that 
the mis cash miss ratio at these two levels are only 20, 21% and 31% respectively, meaning that only like 6.5% of requests actually hit the disk. Um, and uh, we measure, also measure the um, average missed penalty. It's around uh, 18 microseconds. So uh, basically the disk, uh, disk latency, disk IO latency. And um, so we've been studying execution performance so far. And let's also, let's also include merkleization. Now, this is a TPS graph I showed you earlier of the last 1 million block in historical sync, and Red can do a 14,000 TPS. And this is what happens when you add, uh, when you have to update your, update your state through and persist uh, state changes after each block. Uh, the throughput just drops to, just drop to uh, 1,000 TPS. So, live sync uh, is 14 times lower than historical sync, even in a purely in-memory setting. And um, we, uh, I think there, uh, so we measure it, and we measure one level deeper, and there are actually two factors that can, uh, that can explain this, um, this behavior. The first one is the addition of mercalization. Mercalization alone adds, uh, incurs a 9.3x slowdown um, compared to uh, on top of historical sync. And then because live sync needs to write data back to the database after each each block, so it incurs an additional 1.5x slowdown. And but but why is merkleization so expensive? Um, well, the reason is that in order to uh, the, the state try, you have a tree structure, and in order to update the state root, there's going to be a lot of tree traversal, and this tra tree traversal will translate a lot of uh, database read operations. And even though. Uh, we, we're, we're running on uh, 500 gigabytes memory, even though all the, data, all, the, all the database tables related to the MPT fit in memory. The software overhead associated with this uh, database, with in particular MDBX read operation, is pretty high. We measure it to be about 1.2 microseconds per operation. Okay, so um, things uh, get even worse when, uh, when MPT doesn't fit in memory. So we also rerun this uh, live sync experiment um, using uh, under, various, um, under various memory limits. This table summarizes the result. So it's easy to see that the merkleization cost far exceeds the other costs like execution cost and, and uh, data persistence cost. In addition, when the limit when the memory limit goes from 500 gigabytes to 8 gigabytes, uh, the, the mercalization has a slowdown of 6.9x, which results in an overall 5.3x um, uh, slowdown of the, of the TPS. So, um, okay, let's do a quick recap before, before, going, into part, before going into part two. So uh, we start with uh, nice and juicy 14,000 TPS at the beginning with historical sync, and then we add merkleization in live sync, and it drops to 1,000 TPS. And then if we further limit the memory limit to 8 gigabytes, we get only uh, 20 TPS. And uh, finally, if the, um, say the full node operators are not comfortable with uh, using running an entire CPU at 100% utilization. If they're only given 10% CPU utilization, then we're looking at maybe a 20 TPS. And uh, so you see the trend here, right? Um, <laughs> fortunately, uh, we'll be able to do much better. Okay, so at Mega East, we believe that uh, L2 is actually the best place for, for performance innovation. The reason is that L2 enables the so-called uh, heterogeneous scaling, uh, the, the, meaning that different types of nodes can vary significantly in their, number, uh, in their numbers and in their hardware requirements. So for example, at layer two, you can have just a small number of sequencers. And uh, because of that, you can afford to run them on very beefy, uh, on very beefy machines. And if you're doing ZK rollup, you have this provers that's going to uh, run on uh, specialized hardware in the future anyway to reduce the, the, the proof generation cost. Or if you're doing OP rollup, then um, if you design your challengers to be stateless, then their hardware requirement could be extremely low. 
And then finally, there's the roll-up full nodes. Uh, they don't need to re-execute transactions. So, uh, they so they can actually run on very cheap commodity machines. But there will be um, tens or even hundreds of thousands of them, um, depending on how popular your, your roll-up is. Uh, note that this idea of heterogeneous scaling is actually um, uh, introduced a long time ago. So for example, uh, in Vitalik's uh, Endgame post uh, back um, in 2021, explained, um, he argues that if you want to do high performance blockchain, um, it's, it seems, to be, uh, it seems uh, inevitable that you will end up with a relatively centralized uh, sequencer design. However, it's acceptable if you can also if you can also achieve trustless and decentralized block validation. In addition, uh, you have some you still have some censorship uh, anti censorship uh, protection mechanism in place. So um, let's just run L2 sequencers on Solana level uh, servers, which means like a dozen CPU core. Uh, at least 256 uh, memory gigabytes memory, fast NVMe SSDs, and um, uh, over 100 gigabits per second network bandwidth. And uh, we run that on beefy machines, and we can apply all the software tricks we know to improve software efficiency. So to improve execution performance, we can do parallel EVN uh, to exploit the parallelism both at the CPU and SSD le level. And we can do JIT compilation or, um, or, or a stylus EVM plus like techniques to boost the single thread uh, EVM or VM performance. As for Merkleization, we could paralyze Merkle updates. Uh, REST doesn't do it yet. Uh, that's why all the workloads we are testing are still single threaded. And we could also optimize the DB just for Merkleization. And we could um, also design more efficient authenticated data structures to replace MPT or vertical tree. But sequence are not really our problem, right? So the real question is whether your full node can actually keep up with the sequencer. So this is your full node. Maybe it has four core CPU, eight gigabytes RAM, and 100 megabits per second network connection. Um, how can you keep up? So uh, let's walk through uh, the workflow of a, of a full node. So first of all, uh, these roll-up full nodes actually uh, technically they, they don't need to re-execute transactions because they can just rely on external proofs to check the correctness of state, uh, state transition. So instead, they can just receive state diffs uh, over the network. They're advertised by the sequencers. And the nice thing about it is that these state diffs can be highly compressed, which means you can save a lot of precious network bandwidth at the full nodes. After receiving the state diffs, um, the full node needs to update, apply the state changes to, uh, to, to its local database. But fortunately, this is going to be uh, batch writes, and batch writes can be executed relatively efficiently. Uh, well, as I mentioned earlier, data locality also help because hopefully most of the updates can be absorbed at the, um, at the cache layer of the DB, so reducing the disk IO. And finally, the full node needs to update its state try. If we, it needs to maintain a state try if it wants to serve like clients. Um, and know that uh, with eight gigabytes memory, there's no way to fit your MPT in memory. So, um, uh, or a state try in memory. So this is going to be the most challenging part. But we are actually quite optimistic about it. We, we think it's actually doable uh, by combining a number of smart optimizations. So um, our vision, here's our vision for future high performance L2s. And uh, I, I call them mega rollups. Uh, but I, I've been a little bit sloppy in, in the use of terms here. So um, feel free to replace rollup with uh, L2, Validian, Op Optimian, or any, any other term as you see fit. So we envision that each mega rollup, ZK or OP, in the future will be able to provide uh, 100,000 to 200,000 TPS, the complex smart contract interactions, not just peer-to-peer -peer payments. And it can, each mega rollup can support very large state, like terabytes of state, without performance degradation. And there could be hundreds or even thousands of them. In addition, sequencers of mega rollups will be somehow decentralized. Uh, however, we don't want to reintroduce the, um, the, the network or consensus bottleneck. And mega rollups will be built on top of, uh, they must, build on top, uh, must be built on top of uh, high bandwidth DA layers such as uh, Eigen DA. And optionally, they, could, uh, they might also need a specialized and very highly uh, optimized settlement layer on top of Ethereum if Ethereum would become a bottleneck. 
Okay, so uh, that's all I have, and um, I, um, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs> yes, please. You said like the, the sequencers will be like the fast machines and the rest will be like behind it. So basically there will be something like Solana is doing. Because they have like the, the validator which is like creating four blocks and then moving to another validator and the rest are just basically taking the changes. Am I right? Um. I don't think so. So in this case, uh, roll up full nodes, they do need to keep up with the sequencer. It's just that they're performing a uh, little bit less work. For example, they, 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 do need, they do not need to re-execute transactions. And they can receive a smaller amount of data in the form of uh, state diffs. Uh, so basically, the overall network performance, the end-to-end -end performance is not going to be determined by, by your sequencers because well, it's very cheap to, to run, to, to rent very high-end servers in the cloud. And there are so many software optimizations you can do at the sequencer level. But the real question is, given eight gigabytes memory, four core CPU, and 100 megabits uh, network connection, can you optimize your full node under this constraint so that they can keep up with, say, 100 to 200,000 TPS? Okay. Yes, please. That, would it be fair to call a full node then, or would it be a white client, or do these data carry white proofs for data spread? So I call them full node because I, uh, because uh, because they still hold the entire state of blockchain. So, um, yes, but uh, I know it's a little bit uh, deviation from the, from the usual term that people are usually more comfortable with. Um, so, yes, they will be, these will be the full nodes that keep the entire state but do not re-execute transactions. Okay, got it. But um, I, I guess, like, how would they know that they, they get assigned transaction payloads later on? Like, how would they know that the the sequence not data. So the thing is that they're going to rely on external proofs to validate the state transition. So in the case of um, ZK rollup, they'll be checking, checking the proofs. And in the case of optimistic rollup, they just have to wait for the challenge uh, period to expire. Yes, please. Um, have you thought about the this architecture design choices impact on um, say make a mega ZK EVM, make a provable execution on the, like the, what would be harder to make a provable mega ease? A provable, so, um, yeah, so, so the thing is that, so uh, the techniques we're, we're developing um, are compatible with both optimistic and ZK, ZK uh, rollup or, or L2. Um, but right now we are more focusing on the uh, optimistic style L2 because, not because of performance, both OP and, and ZK can be made uh, to run at 100 or 200,000 transactions per second. I think the difference here is uh, the transaction fee, how, how expensive it's going to be. And ZK is probably going to be more expensive due to the proof. Sorry, uh, did, uh, is that your question? Maybe I misunderstood. No, I mean, right? So for example, if people want to build a provable parallel execution EVM, right? Okay. So suppose people are taking mega ease spec of this like a parallel execution EVM as a model to do the provable like ZK EVM, mm -hmm. right? Do you think some of the, I just wonder, some of the architecture decisions you made for the parallelization would make the provable variant harder or easier? For, uh, <clears throat> I, I think the short answer is that it doesn't matter because um, this parallelization uh, this parallel EVN, uh, well, if you're doing, say, you're using a uh, block STM algorithm from the Aptos, you report it to, to EVN, um, then it's the nice thing about it is that the parallel execution part is fully encapsulated inside the EVN. So from the outsider, it, it's no different than a single thread EVN just runs faster. So uh, to prove it's doing the right job, it's, uh, it's the same as a single thread EVN. Okay. 